Okay. All right. Thank you all for attending today. Welcome to Soul Radio, uh, presented by Soul Rad, the online literary uh, magazine for comics. I am your host, Alex Hoffman. I am joined today to talk exclusively about Beth Hetland's Tinder with the author herself, <laughs> along with the amazing Jules Bakes Woo. and the very humble, not at all knows everybody in comics, definitely not a genius, Rob Clow. <laughs> definitely um, not a genius. Definitely not a genius. And uh, we are talking today about Beth's amazing kind of terrible book. Amazing <laughs> in the way, and amazing because it is a great read, terrible because, oh. Biblically terrible. Biblically terrible, yeah, there we go. That's the, that's the, that's that the That is the quote I should have had. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing and biblically terrible. Um, so Tinder, I wanted to start, I kind of wanted to, I wanted to start the conversation and kind of get your thoughts on this. Um, and I'll let my other two excellent critics dive in as well. Um, I wanted to get the sense of where the project came from, kind mm. of like what what got you interested in this story of the oh, what I'll say the feminine ideal, the mm. and then the self mutilation and yeah. the and the, I think the kind of like the mimetics of of image, if you will. I kind of wanted to. I think maybe like the cost of the feminine ideal. Yeah, the co- that's, mm. a good, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, mm, okay. I think, uh, where did it come from? It's a, As with anything, I think with comics, it's a lot of little things that build up. Um, I'm a female-bodied, identified woman, and um, I think that because I am incredibly intense in my career interests and passions, I was being, I started to notice I was, I noticed that I was being asked a lot of questions that were not related to my career ambitions or goals. Um, They were more like, oh, you've been dating for a while with somebody. When are you going to get married? Or now that you're married, when are you going to have kids? Or like, I'm ready to hold your children and watch them grow up. And I was like, cool, glad it's your choice. Um, And that started accumulating, that continued, and I was... Uh, really bristled at that idea that anyone else would have input on that besides myself and maybe all my partner. Right. Um, so that was Welcome really a big part of it. Radio. I think also just like seeing my friends like in their lives, like what they were doing was a part of it. But I, f- I feel like even mm-hmm. though like here we are, 2024, there is still a conversation, whether spoken or unspoken, of you can either have a career or a family. You can't do both. And I think that, am I allowed to curse? Yes. I think that's fucked up, like seriously. And I, like there are other, like I teach at an art school, there are other people who I know, like other uh, professors and women who I know have like families, but there's this period of time, and understandably you have to shift priorities, but there's a period of time where you have to stop what you're doing to do this other thing and sometimes you don't go back to it. Mm -hmm. And I don't like it. I feel like this idea of like self-sacrifice or this idea of like having to remove a part of you in order to quite literally feed another part is really, um, it's difficult for me to hold that space. But it's also a threshold I cannot cross and then return from. Mm -hmm. You either go or you don't. Right. So yeah, the parts that are consumed don't grow back. Yeah, they're gone. You ate them. Yep. It's over. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, I think I think that that in a nutshell, that's sort of where a lot of that come from. I'm sure there's there's other things of like more uh, quite literal. Like I was chaperoning a trip to Ireland, and I was very very lucky to have the opportunity that for this trip, the students all got studio space. Um, and were able to do a residency, and because they were very well-behaved students, thank you, Ireland trip 2019, I didn't have to do a lot of work, and so I got a studio space and could hang out in Ireland and make a book. Awesome. (laughs) How long was that? It was about a month. Wow. And that's, that's where a lot of the, like, writing, the initial images, and, like, about two thirds of the thumbnailing happened. Did you, in doing this, um, 
technically, how would you describe this book? It is a work of horror. Yes. And it's a work of body horror in particular. Um, but, and it is these things. But I, I, th I feel like the beating heart of the book is that it is an absolutely excoriating satire. <laughs> like, yeah. in like the bleakest possible humor. Um, <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> like, when you were doing this, were you thinking, oh, this is funny? <laughs> or what 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 effects were you going for here? Because it's also like it's also like a, a genius. It's not just funny as a satire, but like the the satire is so directly incisive, literally, um, on some of the scenes <laughs> of this particular kind of, of culture and person. Uh, what what I guess you know. It's, it's, it's kind of a dumb one. What are you going for? What was, what was, what was, your, what was your intent? Yeah. What were you hoping the reader would, would get, see from it and get from it? Well, I wanted, I like, to me, I think what's challenging about working in genre is that it, it flattens it, right? Like, no matter what you do, as soon as you assign a label to it, it becomes this kind of um, touchstone thing. So, like, saying horror is, is difficult. Like, yes, it is horror. And it is also so many other things. But the satire component is like, I I'm so glad that you pick up on it because to me, like the friend group is really like what I'm thinking about when you're mentioning this is that like Carol Ann, the main character, has this group of friends. Um, uh, and I think that they are the most, maybe the most like amusing to, uh, to me, like part of this. And I mean, selfishly, I'm making work that I want to read and I want to see. And so there's, there's a little bit of like snarky Beth bristling at this one type of person that is depicted um, in like media. And also like, I know these women, like they're inspired by real people. And also like the dial is turned way up on them. My favorite, uh, of the friends is she has two friends named Katie, Katie with an IE and Katie with a Y, and they're dating. <laughs> and I think that's amazing. Because <laughs> it's like, of course you have a friend that's like, oh, it's Amanda, but not that Amanda, it's Amanda J, right? Like it's, there's always that, that, that person in your life where you're like, which Josh is this? Right. Katie with a Y, yeah. Uh, if in the movie LA Story, he meets a woman named Sandy, it's like, oh, finally someone normal name, it's like, it's spelled S-A-N-D-E-E-E -E -E with a squiggle at the end. <laughs> I also really appreciate the moments where Carol Ann is um, it, like kind of playing into the like playbook of mm. this kind of group of friends. Yes. She's like, oh, it's just like the first date. Don't be sad. But meanwhile, she's got this like, master plan. Long term scrapbook yeah. where she has been like putting yeah. wedding photos of like cutting out. Yeah. Yeah. She know? goes and gets drinks with like her friend Madison. And mm -hmm. Madison's like, oh my God, you guys are going to be like Jim and Pam of, of, our, of our office. And you're going like, to have a no. neighbor day. And she's like, no, don't say that. She's like, you're going to get married. You're going to have babies. It's going to be so happy. And Caroline's like, please stop. <laughs> please don't. And like, you know, is like kind of putting on this farce or this oh, she facade. Goes into, like, yeah. Real acrobatics. She's, yeah. Like, down here, yeah, yeah, and her, her overly dramatic. I think similarly when she's on the phone working on that scrapbook, she says something like, oh yeah, I'm watching a same sitcom I watch over and over again, which is like very classically part of that as well. And yeah. Yeah, for sure. And But it's all at first. It is, it is. It really is, yeah. Because she's, I mean, she's, when is she not acting? When is she not performing? Well, I, I would say I think it seemed like, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it seemed to me like the moments she wasn't acting, you portrayed her being shown from a really unflattering angle, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Like it, mm -hmm. th that was the non-Instagram moment. Yeah, yeah. It was the only time you really felt like you were seeing her is when it's from like here, you know? Yeah, like, this this deep like, yeah. it's our- <laughs> You see up her, up her like nose. Yeah. Fat. Yeah, well, it's like when you open up the chain. camera on your phone and you weren't expecting to, and it just shows you like the hell that you are. Well, and and <laughs> and so much of that is linked to her staring at her phone, right? Like that's right. the phone's yeah. perspective of her, even though she's not always looking at her phone when that image happens. But that's that's, but that's a part really of it, her. and oh, that was and so it's clear. it's her watching, it's her being mm -hmm. watched, and and what that sensation is like again, like folding in these ideas of this like external pressure, or this external observation like observation is such a big part of the book in a multitude of ways you've preempted one of my questions which is about surveillance like yeah. this is a you know this this book to me feels like a book 
not just about the things we've already been discussing, but a book about the way people observe your life, the way that people are engaged with you on that surface, like checking in, the, you know, the Facebook, the, t the Twitter, that the Instagram the, the photos, like it really feels like a book that is grappling with the, the dangers of our current surveillance state, if you will. Or like the contrast between how you're being surveilled and how you're inviting surveillance. Yes. And those are two different things, right? And, and I, yeah, it'd be great to hear thoughts about that. Yeah, I think, in so, I mean, I live in a, in a big city and there are many times where I feel like I'm completely alone even though I'm surrounded by people. Um, and there's this like perceived privacy that happens. Um, and I think about that a lot. And I think about the way in which like we like project or put out what we want people to see like on a social media standpoint. But then there's also like how we behave in front of like certain groups, like the way that I interact with somebody like I don't know, at the grocery store is, is maybe different than I interact with them at SPX, right? Um, in some ways, they're all still part of me. They're all, they're all a facet of who I am. And also, there's these different levels of like performance or um, mm, behavior. And I think that it's, it's interesting to think about like, what are you doing when somebody's not watching? And how do you even know when somebody's not watching? Right. Um, and I think a lot about the element of like somebody learning through behaviors, like she's kind of reflecting her friend group back to, like their behaviors back to them. She's projecting and putting out into space by like visual manifestation. Like it's not actually witchy, but it's a little bit spooky, the scrapbook and kind of like the way that she burns it and like releases it or whatever. And then- Well, she does kind of have her own spells, right? Like she has- In, in a matter of- yeah, cer I mean, there's certainly referenced, but I think that it's not so straightforward. Like, there was, there was one point where somebody asked me, like, like, is she a witch? She's got, like, a cat, and she, it's familiar, and she, like, makes this, this burn, yeah, she, like, makes a spell, and, like, she does this, there's these, like, weird symbols, like, oh, she's, she's a witch, and I was like, she, I mean, she's not, she's just a woman, like, so many of them were just women, right, like, right. and that's folded into this as well, is, like, what does that mean to think about just because you believe in, you may or may not believe in some kind of like symbolism or some kind of manifestation. And it's referenced in there too, like the secret of like, I'm putting it out there. Like, mm -hmm. is that witchcraft? Is just being a woman witchcraft? Like, is that, I don't know. I that got you're... a little off track, but. No, that's, that's you're showing some like raw impulses that kind yeah. of like. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so much is impulsivity. I mean, yeah. eating, picking, like. Yeah. It's kind of interesting. In thinking about Carol Ann, and in many ways she's a character who transcends the idea of, you know, is she a villain, is she a hero, is she a victim, yeah. what is she exactly? And, and the way you're, you explore this character, uh, it's clear that she's a sociopath, but only in the sense that, like, she is completely devoid of the concept of any kind of sense of empathy. Like it doesn't really exist in her in a way that is kind of natural, mm. um, and but she's aware of her environment because she interacts with it in a particular way, and it's almost like my the, my favorite scenes where she was practicing in the mirror <laughs> her expressions <laughs> of how to congratulate someone yeah. and do it in a way that feels naturalistic and non alienating mm. and she became good enough at it that like no one suspected a thing. But yeah. also the mirror is so like segmented and divided and there's so many different like rep like angles of her mm -hmm. showing up in the eye at the same time. And and the kind of the you know what is she what is she really what's the what are the bad things she actually does? And there's like yeah. one really bad thing and it's kind of a reflection of this kind of lack of empathy, um, you know, that someone would naturally have for like their pet. Um, that like, you know, p people who, I I've noticed that some of the most loving people I know, some of the most empathetic people I know are people who have very close relationships with their pets. That's a very mm -hmm. meaningful thing. 
Yeah. And uh, you almost get the sense of Carol Ann that like the pet was just an accessory. A prop. Yeah. That like. Yeah. It's like, oh, I get to talk about my cat. This mm -hmm. is the thing I do before I have the baby. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Which is. Uh, yeah, it's a practice. Yeah. <laughs> no, so I, messed up. But it's like the, the idea of like you get a plant. You keep that alive, you get a pet, keep that alive, have a baby, right. keep that alive. <laughs> like, Robert, but I think you're spot on when you say that she's devoid of empathy, but I, I, I think further, she's actually devoid of almost everything. Yeah. And she's just like a pure reflection of expectation, mm. right? Like, she is only this feminine standard and, and the attempt to meet it. Like, it's not just empathy that, that's the problem for her. Talking about the witchiness is interesting because with the pet, it, it kind of brings up the idea of like a witch being, being willing to like sacrifice their familiar. Yeah. No, actually, that was really interesting because one of my favorite books is The Once and Future King by T.H. White. Mm. It mm -hmm. always will be. It yeah. It never won't be. Um, and there's a scene in uh, the retelling of Morgan, like the Morgan Le Fay um, analog where she very casually takes a cat and she's got a spell she kind of wants to try and she puts the cat in like a boiling cauldron and, and like the, the, the story like deals with it very casually. Like yeah, it yeah. deals with it from how he, yes. she thinks about it. And right. she's putting on her makeup and stuff while the cat is just, you know, coming apart. <laughs> the, I know, I'm so sorry. I should have maybe trigger warning this. Sorry. Um, but the point is, um, yeah. It, it, like, there are a lot of ways to portray, like, witchiness, but also, like, that sociopathic uh, impulse at the same time um, that, you know, attracts. Yeah. It, which is not to, well, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think when I think about her as, like, a void, to me, a lot of her impulses are to fill that, to try to find a way to, like, fill it with these things. Because she's, in some ways, like, yes, she's a sociopath. Yes, she's. D like does not have empathy or understanding for a lot of other people um, at all. And also she feels like, I think that she feels like she's supposed to. And so she's like, okay, I have this big hole in me. What's supposed to go in there? And she's like, okay, well, I see this person is like, all right, getting married. Like, you know, and that, that fills that. And, but the, the sequence in the beginning that then is repeated where she's kind of like nesting and she's pregnant and she's happy and she's like doing the um, stay home thing and like the domestic thing and then that smile fades and it, it dissolves and it goes away and then there's sequences later that are repeated over and over again of her being deep, like her, she is deeply unhappy and it is not filling that void and she's still looking for more. And she's still trying to get more. I wanted to uh, jump in, and, and I, I've stayed on this page for longer than I normally would because <laughs> I wanted to ask a little bit about color yeah. and the way that you're thinking about your color choices throughout the book. Mm -hmm. I find um, a couple, there are a couple things that I that I think about, and one that um, that Jules brought up while we were com having a conversation on the couch outside, waiting for this, was one the 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 color choices are so deliberate, mm -hmm. it seems. And also, the choice to go from a page that has margins to a page that doesn't is also extraordinarily deliberate. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to have you talk through kind of like the, the th things you were thinking about when you were making those decisions. Yeah, I really, I mean, I, I feel like I say this to my students all the time is like I write in pictures like my best way to communicate is through imagery um, and I think a lot about what is happening internally and how do you visualize like sensations or feelings or um, the idea of like some like tent like being tense or like um, ramping up an anxiety or a worry um, and one of the things that I love about film is that the audio component can help kind of indicate how you're supposed to feel dis regardless of what the imagery is showing you. So a lot of the approach to the color was actually not in like a synesthesia way, but in a way that's like I'm trying to clue you in and train you as a reader to pick up on a certain type of melody or a certain type of tone to say like, these are the violins tremoing. Like mm -hmm. you should feel tense, you should feel nervous, you should feel scared. The very first instance of a new color 
is when she slices the steak open and we get yeah. that pink right away. And then that I'm teaching you is like a, a trigger or a sense to say like something bad's gonna happen. And I'm, I show you that immediately with this set of pages that you're showing of the like first dream sequence here. Yeah. Um, but then later I'm tricking you. There are plenty of times where I'm showing it and I want you to feel tense, but what you're seeing is not tense at all. Mm -hmm. And it's like a, a, I'm trying to play with your sense of unease and your sense of comfort, and especially moving from like a very rigid grid, a very rigid kind of like rhythm or pacing in the same way that when I drop that and then all of a sudden, not only are we full bleed, there's no gutters, there's not really a place to rest or hide, but also the logic of paneling is broken. Mm -hmm. Some of the panels are individual and should be read left to right, top to bottom, and some of them are playing with the simultaneity of visuals on a page to say, you open the book, you're gonna see this no matter what, it's really yeah. big, or like it's really bright, or it's really disgusting. Yeah. Um, and the um, dream sequences are, I think, they're really weird, but I really love them. <laughs> and like, I, I don't always, thank you, I don't always have answers for everything. A lot of it is very intuitive, um, but is a little bit of like a puzzle or a game I'm playing with myself. There's a ladder dream sequence. Um, I mean, this one in particular is like hinting kind of at the overarching thrust of the entire story. Yeah. And then there are others that are really hyper-specific to certain moments. Right, right. And then one later on where we're starting to kind of, she's unraveling even more. It's like the last, the final dream sequence yeah. where there are things that are not happening in the book but are indicating kind of her internal threshold that she has started to break and is falling apart in that way to kind of key you up for the ultimate color blast at the very end, yeah. which is like this super saturated Dario Argento inspired, like your eyes should hurt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually that, through those whole final like crimson pages, I just was very aware of this like high pitched feeling in my head. Yeah, so you did it. Okay, great. <laughs> I mean, yay. Yeah. That's done. Yeah, when it, Thank I you. think the first time I saw the the sliced open steak, I was like, oh, this is not right. This is not yeah. good. Like it's like no, it's a medium rare. What are you talking medium about? Medium rare steak, and then but I'm it's like, tasty. but it's not. It's not, it's not. It's not. It's not that. It, it, this feels bad. Like yeah. into like the, the the way that you're able to pull that fluorescence out and just kind of like all right okay you know and, and I do think it, it's very effective. Thank you. But I think too what we didn't talk about is uh, the lack of margins in the dream pages, right? Mm -hmm. Like all all yeah. the like real life sequences have like a, a buffer. Yeah, they know, have a healthy have some distance and a then, real healthy gutter. Yeah, and then when you change, <laughs> you turn the page and you're in this nightmare and there's there's just like no escape. Yeah. yeah. It, that's yeah. very like panic inducing actually. Yeah, it's nerve wracking. Yeah. yeah. I found that um, a lot of this book is about gaze and what we can know and what we can't know about others. Mm -hmm. It's like the essential question of like existentialism. Like how can we really connect with others mm -hmm. in what ways? And so when we're we're talking to someone, how can we trust language? Yep. Can we trust yep. language? Right. And this book is a very compelling argument that says, well, in a society where like, especially now, where everything is an image, is a screen, is a reflection, and that all of these reinforce um, the images and uh, the expectations of society that we see every single day, that the grid you use kind of really cleverly reinforces the way, you know, we're all kind of in boxes. Mm -hmm. We're all kind of, yep. and that the dream sequences without the, that are like full bleed, um, are really the only time you as the author lets us see inside her head, lets us see what's really, what is she really experiencing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's clear what is she really is experiencing in her dreams and then towards the end is horror, is yeah. like this unrelenting scream that she is trying this, you know, she she is she is the void, and this is what the void looks like inside of her. It's just this nonstop terror. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that it's 
kind of no wonder that she would do anything possible to alleviate it, mm -hmm. fill it, make it look different. Um, and that simultaneously, her friends can't see that she's afflicted this way, but also simultaneously, like, you know, her husband and even the reader can't see what is making her do these like incredibly fucked up things. Mm -hmm. um, and that you're just giving, and, and the kind of the, almost the, not abstract, but like non-narrative nature of these horrific images. Right. So there's, there are, they're almost too difficult to apprehend. <laughs> like you don't, you don't want to stare at these pages. You don't want to look at every detail that like. What? The Why not? The, gesh, the <laughs> Come gestalt on. of them of this it's like this is just gestalt horror. I know I had to walk away. It's like No, they're you know, beautiful. The, the insect <laughs> well, they it's, are. it's like, <laughs> it's like this. um and, but it's almost like but it mimics this kind of the flash of an image. Yeah. That we see around that we don't want to think about, you know. Yeah. Don't think about the horrible thing. Don't think about the horrible <laughs> thing. Then you have to think about the horrible it's thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the moment where she's picking the cat's claws and teeth out of the burger. I'm like, I, I'm like, I gotta get the fuck out of here. This is not, this is not good. You don't, I'm yeah, but doesn't, <laughs> doesn't a little party you think like, I wonder what that would taste like. <laughs> I hate to say, I hate to say no, because it feels like you're setting me up so perfectly to say yes, but oh my no, God. No, okay, that's fine. I, 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 I don't want, no wonder. Yeah, I, I don't that's fair. Like like that. that. Yeah. I don't, I don't. <laughs> I don't know. I, this might be a little too granular, and if it is, feel free to sure. reject it, but I'm wondering what, what was the difference between red and yellow? Um, there's not really a difference between the red and yellow. I thought that the the to me like the the red reads more on like a pink ish. It's like it's not really like a true magenta, but it's like in that vein. And then the the yellow is like kind of a golden rod. And I think to me it's simply like an aesthetic palette of like I liked how those two looked when they kind of created that like orange or that like almost like creamsicle color. Um, it was just kind of like a playing around with it. I knew I wanted the pink. I knew I wanted the um, the like purple and like that super like saturated fuchsia. And I needed something to balance it. And the yellow was something I had experimented with in a, a mini comic to try to create like the most like dissonant color relationship that sort of vibrated a little bit. And that ticked that box for me in a way that was like visually aesthetically satisfying <laughs> you're saying these things and i'm trying not to analyze your outfit right now sure yeah there's oh, yeah. a lot of this red and this yellow oh yeah oh yeah, yeah. i just i mean pallet of my life right yeah. <laughs> then frames on your glasses which I know. match yeah, exactly book. yeah but what are you talking about i don't think about these things <laughs> i'm not a massive control freak about what i do <laughs> Sure, sure. Yeah, I definitely don't practice this interview in the mirror. Let's split three ways or, you know, <laughs> have a burger for lunch just to prepare. And I do have a cat, though. He's alive. He's healthy. They're both fine. <laughs> I, I feel bad about No, I, th I also feel bad about the cat, to be perfectly frank. Like, that was incredibly difficult. But not only was Chip something that would... This should be a tip off from the beginning is he's named after a food. Okay, come on. Mm -hmm. I had to kill him. Um, but oh, also, there you go. Yeah, yeah. there it is. Um, but also, he's, a, little, he's a snack. No, I was, like, I was like, yeah. I don't think about cat names. It's yeah. just like, you know. Every, Rob, comics, everything has a choice. That's true. No, you're right. <laughs> but okay, so the cat is modeled after my actual cat. And like, in horror, it is a classic trope of like the pet. Is death is like a signal of things that are really, really wrong, um, and especially if a pet is murdered in a traumatic way. But I couldn't bring myself to, like I had to do it off panel, like I can't, I couldn't do it. I, like I love my cat so much, and I was like, as far as I got with the drawing of it, I was like, I'm so sorry, buddy. <laughs> I was like holding him like, I'm sorry. Well, that's actually <laughs> a really interesting impulse, like, mm. because it kind of seems like you were trying to, I don't, I don't know, kind of hurt, like, hurt yourself while you were writing this so that maybe you could get into this like like because I know if I was writing about you know I'm I have pets that I'm obsessed with and yeah. like if, if I was to imagine something hurting them it would hurt me I and mean, like it kind of yeah. seems like you, you had this maybe part of your process where you're trying to get yourself out of 
your comfort zone in this really oh sure intense way. Certainly, I mean, I think any good work of art should push you out of your comfort zone in yeah. some way. I don't know that I'm intentionally like, yeah, I feel the pain, Beth. Like, I don't want to like. Put that <laughs> no, you know what I mean? but but I do think that like there is an element of this that like it's a drawing. It's just drawings. Yeah. Like, I, it, it is emotional, but it is just drawings, and I can close my iPad and walk away from it. So, right. yeah. But were you actually trying to, like, shake yourself into this, like, other no. person who would do such a horrible thing? No, 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 no. I did have to think, though, if, like, could someone do that, like, physically? And I was like, yeah, I guess so. We're much bigger than them. <laughs> just, like, mathematically, I right. don't know. Right. <laughs> well, it's happened before. I mean, it's not... Sure. Yeah. Yeah. They will eat you if you die. So. You sure. Die. Yeah. Why not? Why not swap it? Right. <laughs> I've always thought that's that always a, that's a really good point. Actually, I had not considered cat will eat you that. Like, you I'm yeah. pretty sure that after you die to a cat or a dog, you really just look like a birthday cake with like your, your face printed on it. Yeah. You know, yeah. and that 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 makes me feel better about the fact that you know my dog would absolutely um, devour my body you know, if I died. Yikes. Yep. Yikes. <laughs> This is going some real fun places. <laughs> what a shock. <laughs> what, were, were you a surprise? No, no I wasn't. Uh, I have a question um, with regard to the book, and feel free to not answer it. How, does, um, how did your own relationship with your own body inform like, the writing and drawing of this book? Like oh, Beyond like, the societal yeah. pressures... Uh, I was kind of curious about that. Well, my fun answer to this question is I have a body, and having a body is horrible. So that's how it informed it. But I mean, by horrible, I mean like you got to feed it, you got to water it, it has to sleep, it needs exercise, and you got to repeat, it. you got to wash it, like you got to do all that stuff all the time. It's terrible. What an annoying pet. Um, but <laughs> the longer answer is more that, um, I don't know, I think I'm still trying to figure out that answer, is like my relationship with my body continues to be complicated, nuanced, and like a big tangly mess of yarn um, that has pieces that I didn't put there, I guess. Um, and I'm still trying to unravel that and make sense of it and like navigate it in a way that feels authentic without feeling too overwhelming, I guess. Because um, I noticed you explored this kind of idea in a mini comic you did called Fallow Field. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, it's like... I forgot you know everything I've made. <laughs> <laughs> Except the things I don't show anybody. <laughs> Correct. Um, but like you seem really, in that comic and in Tender, Fallow Field is obviously more like, clearly like more personal and it's clear more clearly about you and this is sort of like more of an exploration of what if I was this other person to some yeah. degree or yeah you know how, or how would a person this person react in this situation but um the way you like I, I was just very impressed in both cases there's a certain um fearlessness in addressing that very thorny problem of being embodied, but also in our culture of being embodied as a woman, especially um, with regard to like medicine, that much of modern Western medicine doesn't give a shit about women's yeah. bodies at all. Yeah, oh yeah. And I say so that it's so cool. My friend Alex. <laughs> but it's right, you're right though. It's no, it's, it's right. And yeah. how like it's women, so cool to have that though. Yeah, and how I'm like just, no, that's terrible. I mean, well, <laughs> and, sucks. and like it sucks ass. And so <laughs> in uh, in modern Western medicine, which has had so many advances, it left behind the traditional medicine of women taking care of women, sure. understanding their bodies, understanding yeah. how it worked. You know, it's like when I when I read like um, like the wandering womb theory 
uh, was accepted up until like the 1960s. Oh my God! It went from Aristotle in the 1960s. Like, yeah, this this is the idea that like <laughs> oh, the that, womb, like, that lady's womb's in her arm. That's why it's hurting. The body causing problems in women. It's insane. It's insane. It's insane that like, these men, the, the yeah. doctors are like, oh well, that seems to make sense. It's insane. It's literally insane. Um, I mean, I mean, I think that 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 is a really good point. Is like the my whole life, I think a lot of things, whether verbally or you know, on purpose or not, has told me that like my body is bad and no good and doesn't work in whatever way it's supposed to. My whole life, and like, how do you deal with that? How do you carry that? How do you think about that every day? That's how this book <laughs> is one. Tiny, tiny little piece where I'm like, oh, maybe this is a way to think about it. This is a way to feel about it. And like, does that necessarily change it? No, but it's a way to hopefully try to like ease in or return to some kind of agency that feels like I was never given anyway. Yeah, reframe it. Yeah, absolutely. Take control of it. I think like, and also horror in particular is an opportunity, I think, especially at this point in time from like, Mm, maybe like 2014 till present is a lot of people shifting from like male gaze slasher like like uh, unnecessary brutality to women to stories that are actually metaphors or more symbolic of other things or other challenges in a way that is like visually difficult or visually upsetting to hint at the deeper more intense solutions or possible themes um, in the way that you're talking about. Yeah, and that's really interesting because you ask, my body is wrong. And so when Carol Ann has that feeling, my body is wrong, well, look at me. I'm making it right now. I'm making exactly. it the way you want me yes. to be. I'm See? making it serve me. Yes. But in the yes. a certain type of way. Yeah, and like also like that's not it's not so bananas that she does that, right? Like, in a lot of ways, we do that constantly, right? Your body's wrong, so go on a diet, lose some weight. Your body's wrong, have medical intervention in different ways. Your body's wrong, change these things, get your hair cut, do this, do that, right? There's all these different solutions of like, okay, I'll make it right then, no problem. But it's never gonna get there, because it's not wrong, it's just a body. <laughs> and anything you take from it to feed a different cause, it's just, being taken. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wow, it's got serious yeah. real fast, Rob. <laughs> really? Alex, what are we going to do? Bring us back to the funny. No, I'm just oh, kidding. Oh, shoot. I don't know what to do. Okay. <laughs> Tell a joke. No, I'm <laughs> joking. I'm, bring us um, back. Uh, I wanted to, uh, I, one of the things I wanted to go back to or at least think about a little bit is the relationship that this book has with meat. Specifically, mm. there's a lot of like meat imagery throughout the book, and even even from the name Tinder, like mm -hmm. you have this and idea the, of the end pages. Kind of, yeah, the, I love I the love marble, the, marbles. the marble beef. Nom nom uh, nom. So I, I wanted to get um, I wanted to get your thoughts on like what you know how did you come how did you come across or come to that that thematic overlay that seems to kind of exist in the entire work? I mean, uh, we're all just meat, man. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't, uh, um, what is a good, how can I distill this? So one of the things in the like writing process for me is a lot of like image collecting, a lot of like imagery, drawing, making, um, collecting, things like that. And there's this really early drawing of like an emaciated woman, like at profile, and she's like going to town on this like chunk of um, organ meat. And I was like, hmm, something's there. Mm. And then that felt like a really interesting way to think about something that is like not considered ladylike, quote unquote, is like to have an appetite, to enjoy meat, to not yeah. constantly be like, I'll have a salad with dressing on the side, or this idea of like, indulgence in a way that I think meat is associated with. I think fruit can too, but I didn't want fruit to feel, like fruit already has its relationship to like the female body and birth and fertility and stuff. And I was kind of like, eh, no thanks. Um, that and scene in the lunchroom where her work friend 
friend is like, how can he eat that sandwich? Yeah. And then again, as Jules points out, we get the the perspective of like, again, up, where like, this is, this is hers when she's real, and this is like, this is her indulgence. This is a thing that very, on a very temporary basis, makes her feel better. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think there's a relationship too to like, you know, disordered eating. I think there's like a relationship to um, like the things that are like considered, considered forbidden. There's like an element of, um, yeah, I don't know the, the like, um, like chewing is, I don't know why that seems to pop into my head right well, now. Violent. but. Yeah, it's, yeah. Is very yeah, 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 yeah. Or Actually. like, hunt, or like hunting, or like stalking. I mean, she like essentially hunts her future husband. Like she hunts him, and like, and also the. Uh, this is the where my brain was going. Sorry, I like took a scenic route here, but um, like the idea of like women being considered like meat or evaluated like meat is also a big important yeah. piece of this to think about. Like, yeah. you are in, like the messaging of like object and like good and what that means to have this standard of that is also I think folded in here. Yeah. Yeah, and that goes to you know, like, you know, the overturning of Roe versus Wade where it's like your function is to provide a body to create another body. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. that's all you're here for. Mm -hmm. And no one you can't you can't say no. <laughs> they have, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Actually, I, would, I would like to hear more about the sandwich thing because one of the more intriguing moments, I think, was early on <laughs> when uh, she... Oh, you're laughing already. I just, no, I just... <laughs> no, like, go ahead. Where she, first, she has the Franken sandwich that she assembles herself from two different sandwiches. Yes. And then later, she has an egg salad sandwich, uh -huh. and both of them are her favorites, and her friend is like... Really? Yeah, she's like, what? Yeah. Are yeah. they both her favorites? They're not. Yeah. She's lying. She doesn't. Yeah. She doesn't have a favorite, does no, she? No, no, no. Yeah. Well, but she. The 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 purpose of that. So, one of the things that is funny to me that I'm laughing about is like I think like sandwich vending machines are disgusting, oh, but I also vile. love them. <laughs> like in like the nastiest. Like like sometimes I'm like dog. I just need a soggy <laughs> ass vending machine sandwich. I'm like I hate it about myself, but I can't resist it. Oh, there's something about and them like. Going in a circle. And like also like I like the nastiest one. Like I love a fucking tuna salad sandwich, y'all. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. Okay, so like also like that's me being like ha 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 funny joke for Beth. Like sandwich vending machine is disgusting. Um, also like yuck. But then the idea of her like making this sandwich by buying two different meat sandwiches and like peeling off all the vegetables and exclusively piling bread and then meat, 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 bread. And then she has this huge like Scooby-Doo style like bite where she's like Argh! and eats it. And her friend is like, ew. And her friend, by the way, Taylor, is eating a brought from home salad in a Tupperware with dressing on the side. <laughs> yeah. um, and that's always what Taylor's drinking. And she has a, a Nalgene water bottle. Um, so then, so her friend says something. Mm -hmm. And to Caroline, she's like, oh, that flagged out of the normal. So the next time she goes to lunch with Taylor, she goes and she's like, let me try this. So she gets eggs. She's like, egg salad, okay. This is normal, surely, yes? And then she's like, Taylor's like, wow, that's stinky. And Caroline doesn't eat that sandwich. She breaks it into pieces on her plate and then crumples it and throws it away. She doesn't eat it. And then the third time you see them having lunch, She's eating a brought from home salad with dressing on the side. It's she's like, she, like learning whoa. the behavior. It's like she's an That's AI amazing. program. A little bit. I mean, but she's a person. I mean, she's a drawing, but like, you know. Yeah. yeah. She's like, she's paying attention. She's savvy. She's aware. She's learning. She's hunting. She's trying to blend in. She wants to be so desperately that she's like, when someone says something to her and it jumps out, she's like, fuck. Okay. Reevaluate. Dial it back. Okay. Yeah. 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 Same thing with when she's at friend's brunch. They all get salads, and she gets a steak. And she kind of has a moment sitting at the table. She's in the center. Everybody's talking about things, and she's, like, aware that she's the one who sticks out. It's like that old-school GPS voice that's just, like, recalculating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Recalculating. Yeah, recalculating. Um, this has been a fantastic conversation. We are Sorry, almost no. running out of time. Really? So, I can ask some questions. Yeah, I was going to say, we are, I, wanted, I would love to open things up to audience questions.
to the packed house of the White Flint Amphitheater. Thank you. <sighs> <laughs> so if you have a question for Beth or any of the uh, panelists, please head to either side of the room where we have microphones waiting batedly uh, <laughs> for you to ask any questions. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, Beth, I know this is your debut graphic novel, but you've been making comics a long time. You bet. Um, and I know that for the last, what, 13 years, you've been teaching at School of the Art Institute? Yep. Um, so have you thought, like, in terms of your process, like, how has being a professor of comics kind of changed your work, and how do you mm. see it here in this book? Oh, man. Thank you, Josh. Josh was a classmate of mine at CCS, and so I think that's actually a really great question. Um, there is, a, I'm gonna try not to get too deep into it, but to me, I take being a teacher and a professor really seriously. I care a lot about my students. What's up, former student? Um, but also I think like, I don't want to be that person that can't meet them where they're at. And I've noticed in the 13 years, and specifically over the last six, how much in my classrooms people are working digital. And in a class of 15, 14 of them will be on their iPads for projects. Unless I tell them they can't, which I very rarely do. But I started realizing like when they're like, but I can't do this thing. And if they did that with paper and nib, I have no problem helping. Brush, no problem. Like any other physical, traditional material, no problem. As soon as I got into the programs, I was really finding myself coming up short. And that's unacceptable to me. In like my pedagogy, in my life, in my MO, like not okay. This whole book is digital, drawn on my iPad for the exact reason to say, the only way I'm gonna get better at this, the only way I'm gonna be able to help them is to do it. Like, I can't just be like, oh, I watched a video or two, I don't know, I kinda know, uh, go ask your friends. Like, nope. Like, and that has really shifted a lot of what I'm thinking about with process, what I'm thinking about with how they're thinking and creating images, with tactics for efficiency, with the ability to say like, hey, a lot of people are working digital and working with publishers, like you can't just have your files at 132 DPI, which is the default effing setting in Procreate. Like get smart, don't be dumb, get better, right? <laughs> and, that, and I mean that, and I say that with love, right? Genuine love, but also like stop it. You're better than this. And so I have to be able to show them that I can do that as well, because who could trust a professor that would say something and then can't do it? So I think that that's one really, really obvious way for that, but also I teach a professional practices class that is all about how to navigate life as a professional cartoonist, illustrator, freelancer, and I show them contracts. I talk to them about negotiations. I tell them everything. They can ask me, what was your advance? What are your royalty rates? How do I pitch to somebody? Open book. And so this is really valuable for that as well. Yeah, thank you. Such a good answer. <laughs> I love teaching. <laughs> They're such weirdos. I love them. <laughs> I, I would love to have more conversation about your your uh, your theoretics of teaching. Where what is your what what what's your theoretical basis for what you're doing? How do you how do you think about the classroom? Um, I think about the classroom as these are my colleagues, and I want to help them be better and faster than I could ever be. And I want them to, I feel like in a lot of ways I took the long way to things and I wanna make it as clear to them what that was and how they can improve that journey. And I think that that's a lot about like sharing information and like flattening the hierarchy of like professor to student, but also maintaining like we're not friends, we're colleagues. And that's a very distinct separation. Um, but also like, I'm here for you, man. Like, yeah. comics is hard. Yeah. And boy, do I know it. Yeah. Comics will break your heart. <laughs> they will, but also they'll stitch it back together and build you a new one. Yeah. And I maybe you need six, sandwiches. yeah, maybe you need six hearts of tuna fish sandwiches from a vending machine. I don't know. 
right? But also I feel like to me, one of the biggest assets that I have in teaching is enthusiasm. Like I really care, I really love comics. I wanna, I wanna do it, I wanna talk about it, I wanna see it, I wanna learn why you think this what thing you're making is this thing and why you wanna do it and like, I want you to be successful. And you're good at it. <laughs> you don't know that, no. <laughs> oh, the book, yeah, sure, okay, yeah. I'll take that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna say it's a good book. If that if that didn't come across, <laughs> the book pretty good. Still yeah. available for sale in yeah. graphic stand. Uh, or better yet, at table H ten <laughs> from me. <laughs> We've got yeah. one more question. Awesome. Hey. Hello. Uh, I'm a huge horror fan. In general, yes. And it seems like there's a number of references to sort of like genre things. Caroline seems like a Poltergeist reference. It is. The the steak feels like a Rosemary's Baby reference. It is. It's not the steak. There's a moment when she's grinding up um, chicken innards and she does eat the liver raw. Yes, that's Rosemary's Baby. Yes, and the song she sings in the beginning, Rosemary's Baby. Yeah, okay. And then, and of course, you mentioned Argento. Yep. Um, I'm curious. I love the, the genre. I love uh, almost everything about it. And I'm curious about what attracts you to horror as like a storytelling device. Mm. <laughs> I love that you're picking up on it. Also, there are a ton of secret Easter eggs. If you look at anybody's like usernames or the hashtags in any of the Instagram posts, yeah, yeah, they're really there's like actors, there's directors, like of some of my favorite horror um, films and things. But whew, why do I love horror? I don't know. It's so weird. Um, it feels like in the same way that like comics has a chip on its shoulder about. Like, yes, we're art, yes, we're literature. Horror, I think, has a similar kind of like chip on its shoulder to be like, yes, I'm legitimate, yes, I'm, I'm, I have more things to say than just like, ooh, yucky. Um, and I feel like a lot of kinship with that. Um, I also think horror is something that produces a bodily sense and reaction in me in a way that other genres just don't. And that is so weird um like even just thinking about like you like just poltergeist right that was the most terrifying movie I, I ever saw in my life I saw it when I was like eight it was a terrible idea to see it when I was eight think about it all the time the face pull is also a poltergeist reference right like there's a lot in there and like thinking about it and then also on top of that like horror movies have this really weird making of history like some of them are just like those scrappy guys who are like doing weird shit in their basement. And like as a zinester, self-publisher, like boy howdy do I relate to that. Like being up late with your pals and making weird stuff. But also like the history and like the connection of all this weird spooky stuff that is unexplainable in horror films. Again, going back to Poltergeist, if you don't know what happened during the filming of that stuff, like yeah. you need to look oh, it up. Yeah. It's horrifying it's in bad. real life ways. Um, but there's also a lot of critical theory that I think about and read. Um, particularly, there's this book by Jude Doyle. Um, their pen name is Sadie Doyle, but it's called Dead Blondes and Bad Mothers. And it's all about um, weaving together in specifically like the female lens of, um, well, like the, the virgin, the whore, and the crone, right? And then um, tying that to like real life things that happened and the, the journalism that happened and then the like fictionalization and like the evolution of that and how that became tropes for things. Like for example, why are most possession stories about young girls who are about 12 to 13? Mm. It's not an accident that that's related to puberty about them turning into a demon who can't control how they behave. That stuff is so powerful and like on the surface you're like, ooh, yucky, but then like when you start thinking about it and you dive into it, I just feel like there's so much that you can sink, sorry, sink your teeth into, sorry, sorry, get into, dig into, whatever you want to say that I just think that it's like, it's really quickly brushed off as like not worthy and I think that there is so much to be said in it. I don't know if that answered anything you cared about, but I felt like it did. Okay. <laughs> felt like I felt really excited about it. Yeah, uh, that sounded good. Also, I, I got to say, for the record, you're not sorry. I'm not sorry. You're yeah, really I'm sorry not. I'm not. Thank you. Oh. I'm so, yeah, caught. Okay. Yeah, gotcha. I, thank right. you. And um, I think, oh, wow, I could talk about this book for days, I think, but I'm 
unfortunately, we're out of time. So Boo. Um, thank you all for attending this panel presentation on Beth Hetland's Tinder. Again, uh, purchasable where all good books are sold. And if you're here at SPX today and not watching this online, please head on over to table H10 and grab yourself a copy. It is good. The book is good. <laughs> it's a good book. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That, that was, was that, that was so fun. Yeah.